Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Erwin Kuperberg from the London Dairy Conservation Commission, and we're very pleased to have all of you with us tonight for this talk on what's happening uh, under and above the snow. Uh, what's happening under the snow is an area called the Subnibian Zone, but I don't know how many audience members we get just that title, so we tried to make it more interesting for you. And uh, uh, just as a quick announcement, this uh, session, as all of the LCC's lectures will appear on our YouTube channel for those of you who missed it or if any of you have to drop out early and want to catch up with it. And we'll give you the link for the LCC YouTube channel later. Actually, I won't because it's a big, big, long link. But I'll post it on the Conservation Commission page where you all went to get the information on this meeting. So right now, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for tonight, Tom Rogers. He's with Nature Conservancy. He's got his master's in biology from the University of Montana and has done research on grizzlies and large carnivores in Yellowstone. And tonight he's gonna depart from uh, talking about large carnivores for the most part and talk about little varmints under the snow, but also uh, deal with some of the bigger animals on top of the snow. So now without further ado, I'd like to get started and uh, get Tom out here. Tom is gonna, give us a little talk, and then at the end of that, we're going to uh, have a Q&A, so you'll have a chance to ask your questions and have a nice conversation about what we've been talking about tonight. Tom? Great, thank you so much. And just, Erwin, if you wouldn't mind confirming that you guys have the screen that it's shared at this point? Yes. And it's, and it's the full one, right, not my notes? That's right. Okay, great. <clears throat> And just one more reminder before we get started, I'd love for everyone to just go on mute so that um, we're all, you know, I can hear my own little kids playing in the background and I apologize if that <clears throat> comes in at any point, but thank you guys so much for having me today. Um, and I'm really happy to be talking about this. This is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. Um, so let's just dive right in here. Um, I'm gonna use uh, almost all of my own photos for this presentation. Um, there are a few other photos that I use, and I always try to make note of the photographer in that case, but most of these shots are mine, and we'll do a little Q&A at the end. So Vermont is really one of the most biologically diverse states in the Northeast. We have, a, um, believe it or not, about a thousand more um, known recognized plants and animals than our neighboring state of New Hampshire, despite being pre pretty similar size. We're really at a crossroad of wildlife corridors in the near Northeast. Um, you know, the state is known for our dazzling displays of, of fall colors, our mountains, rivers, forests, and streams. Um, but what happens with wildlife when things freeze over and this stream becomes this, turns into this one, right? So I don't know if anyone else spent a whole lot of time outside this weekend, um, but I was out quite a bit and I have no idea how any creature could survive in those conditions. Um, so I'll, so actually, I sort of do, or this would be a very short lecture, but being out there with my toes and fingers frozen, all you can think is, how can any but anything get through a winter like this, right? So winter really is the limiting factor for life in Vermont, for wildlife. If you can survive living in Vermont in winter, you can survive living in Vermont. It's really what, um, you know, kind of separates the wheat from the chaff in terms of wildlife in this state. And there are three strategies you know, going back to that idea of how can how can a person survive in, in, uh, in Vermont? There are three strategies that people use, and we'll start with those, and we'll talk about how wildlife basically use the th same three strategies. So first you have the migrators, right? The snow bunnies, the ones that hop on a plane in November and head south, they get out of here, right? Um, you have those of us that are the hibernators, right? The ones that just kind of sit by the fire and don't go outside very much and they just see winter as something to survive and get through. And then you've got the adapters, the thrivers, the ones that really embrace winter and are really good at uh, enjoying it and getting through it in a positive way, right? And wildlife really kind of follow those same three strategies. Um, so of course we have our migrators, the ones that exit the state of Vermont um, during the winter time and, and head for sunnier times. You've got the hibernators, and we'll talk about those uh, in a bit. And then you've got the adapters, the ones that just kind of tough it out and make it through the winter, um, awake, alert, um, and, and they just have to find strategies to do that. And so 
Um, I also want to point out that this moose photo is the first one that's not mine. This is by Jar George Bosworth. Um, so again, one of those few photos, most of them will be labeled. So let's start with the migrators, right? Our warblers, like this uh, black-throated green warbler here. So these guys are going to be the ones that get out of town. Um, they spend the winter in the tropics from the Carolinas all the way down through South America, through the Amazon ba uh, basin. Um, the, the warblers are really going to start heading out of Vermont down, you know, towards the Gulf Coast by about August. Um, they're some of our first birds to arrive, but oftentimes some of our first birds to leave, right? These are really fun to spot in the spring before leaf out, um, but they're not going to, they're not going to make it through Vermont winter. They just get out of here, right? Um, whereas some ducks and geese may actually not head south until December or January, particularly in years where the ponds and lakes remain open. So you can see um, waterfowl sometimes when there's open water all the way through the winter. For them, the coldness is not really a factor. They do have those downy feathers and they're able to survive that and even thrive in it. It's just a matter of having access to open uh, water. And that's really what kicks them down south. And then you've got a few that kind of migrate through Vermont, like these snow geese. I'm sure a lot of you have been to like Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area in Addison County and seen these great migrations. Um, the reason snow geese actually migrate in such huge numbers through Vermont on their way through is because they're actually right now overpopulated. Um, the number of snow geese has more than tripled uh, since the 1990s and they're uh, known to be destroying their fragile Arctic uh, breeding grounds. And so without population reductions right now, like, you know, people are, are really thinking there might be kind of a catastrophic loss of habitat up in the Arctic. Um, but these are, these are birds that just kind of avoid winter as much as they can. Um, some of you may have noticed that not nearly as many are traveling through Vermont because a lot of them are moving, have moved over to the New York side of the lake. There used to be tens of thousands and now there's only usually in the single digits of thousands, seven, 8,000 that will travel through at one time. Our loons are among our migrators, right? They'll stay around uh, in you know late fall and early winter until again, ice starts to come in. And then they set, head not south, but east. They actually head right out to the coast of New England. They change their plumage color, so they don't look anything like what you would see here on a pond in Vermont. Um, but if you are out paddling very late in the season, you can actually see um, some of the young of year that are learning to fly and they are practicing run across the water and uh, getting ready to head out of the state to avoid the winter altogether here. Now, a few birds actually migrate into tropical sunny Vermont during the winter time. Um, snowy owls, red poles, uh, rough-legged hawks, snow bunting, or in this case, case, this pine grosbeak is one of the birds that you might find actually moving into Vermont. Um, a lot of these birds will flock up into larger sized flocks and they spend time, a lot of time feeding on fruit like this on, on ornamental trees, ornamental fruit trees. A lot of the times this fruit's actually fermented and once in a while something like this or a um, 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 wax wing or things like that can actually get a little bit uh, intoxicated from that fruit. So here's what this, uh, this one sounds like. So, and again, not, not every member of every bird species arrives at a single strategy. So some individual bald eagles or blue jays stay in Vermont um, other individuals will actually head out of town for the winter. And so it's, it's not just one strategy for every bird species. Um, and they don't usually tend to go very far, even the bald eagles that have left the state. Kind of a conservation success story, actually. Bald eagles were actually just recently delisted from the state endangered species list uh, this, uh, in 2020. So within the past year, they've been downgraded um, on the listing because they've been so successful. Um, but let's hear, let's hear our bald eagle here. And another migrator that's going to head outside of state, this one really stands out from the pack, right? These are our monarch butterflies. Monarchs are actually uh, one of only a small group of butterflies that engage in a north-south migration, just like birds. Most eastern monarchs actually overwinter at a single site in the mountains of central Mexico. So there are different flight patterns for monarchs across North America. And the ones on the East Coast all tend to go to the same spot in Mexico. Um, the ones in the center and then ones out West actually all tend to go to all the same spot. Um, but one of the neat things about that is that actually it's uh, a single monarch will make it to the wintering grounds, 
but on their return, they never make it. There are actually several generations that are born and live that will actually come back to Vermont. So that monarch that leaves us in the fall never comes back here by the next spring. Um, they, they, several generations are born and die along the way, meaning that the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of the monarch that leaves Mexico uh, at the end of the winter eventually arrives here in Vermont at the end of the summer. And this is kind of cool. Hopefully we can get this to play. I might have to go on the other screen here. But when spring comes around and the birds are making their way back to Vermont, here we go, modern radar can actually pick up bird migrations. And so this happens right around dusk. Birds tend to migrate at night. And you can see some birds flying right up over here. Um, I think this might be the Florida Keys. I've never been able to figure out where this is. Um, but you can see on the radar, actually, these birds flying in large numbers on their way back up to Vermont. Um, so when you're sleeping at night in the spring and fall, just think of all those birds flying above your roof by the thousands on their way back through Vermont or back into Vermont during the migration. So next, let's move on to the ones that actually stick around, the ones that don't jump ship, right? The ones that aren't the snow bunnies and that stay in Vermont and tough it out. So first you have the hibernators. Um, bears, ironically, are kind of the flagship species for quote unquote hibernators, but they don't actually technically hibernate. They're not technically hibernating mammals um, like woodchucks or bats. Um, bears body temperature actually and heart rate and all of their respiration and all that stay pretty close to normal during the winter. So they're not really hibernating. They're not in true torpor. Uh, they actually are just more of in a deep sleep than a true state of hibernation. And they actually go into the dens, um, not because they need to avoid the snow and cold because you know bears have really thick fur. They're well adapted to cold temperatures, but they actually do it just to conserve energy while they wait out the winter months because food is just not available to bears. Bears eat pretty much the same array of things that a human might eat. They're omnivores. Um, they eat meat, they eat a lot of vegetation. The vast majority of their diet is actually vegetation, despite people thinking them of them as carnivores. They mostly eat plants. And there's not a lot of edible plants out on the landscape um, after the snow falls. And so they actually just are triggered to enter their den when food becomes scarce in the fall or early winter. Usually it's the first big heavy snowfall, like the one we got kind of uh, in early December, that really triggers bears that it's time to go in the den. Um, and they'll find, you know, a really a variety of places to den. They'll den uh, under fallen trees. They'll den, <clears throat> one of the common places that we'll see them is uh, like a tree that's died, but it's still standing up. It has that root structure and they dig out the bottom of the root structure and kind of stick a den right under there, under the kind of teepee of dens. And um, as Erwin mentioned, I actually worked in a previous life before I joined the Nature Conservancy. I worked a lot on bears. Um, both for my master's degree and then when I first moved to Vermont. Um, and one of the neat aspects of that is that we were actually a, a project of radio collaring bears. And every winter you have to go into the den to check the collar to make sure that it's not you know, too tight or too loose, that it's not rubbing up against the bear causing any problems. And so you go in with a jab stick and tranquilize the female um, and then pull her out to check on her, to check all of her vital signs and everything like that and make sure she's doing okay and the collar is doing okay. But if she has you have to pull them out and the only thing that's keeping cubs warm in the winter time is snuggling up with their mother and so when the mother's being dealt with by, by the biologist somebody has to take these little baby bear cubs and do this with them stick them right down in the front of their jacket and hold them against your body and keep them as warm as you can so <clears throat> here's a little see the, the fun thing about these cubs is that they're so sleepy and they're so trusting of whoever is holding them so it's a fun thing to bring people along Look at that little guy snuggled right in there in the big downy jacket. And I know the sound is off and everyone's on mute, but I'm pretty sure I just heard everybody say, aw. Um, but one of the neat things about bears actually is that they, um, the sow will become pregnant in the springtime. Their reproductive season is in the spring in May, June is usually the time, but they actually have delayed implantation. They don't implant until they go into the den for the winter, um, at which point, or just before that, and then the cubs are born very young um, right in the den and just spend the first winter nursing with their mother uh, inside the den. And she, they will then stay with their mother all through that first year and in, go back into the den with her that second year as well. So you'll have yearling cubs going in the den with their mother that second year as well. Um, and then in the, the following spring, so when they're about a year and a half old, 
she kicks them out and then she mates with another male and becomes pregnant again. So this is the type of place uh, that bears, a bear is gonna wanna hibernate. So anywhere that's north facing, very cold and very snowy. Now you would think theoretically that a bear would wanna go somewhere kind of south facing and sunny, but it turns out that um, one of the most important factors of a good den site for a bear is a good snow path. Um, we get a lot of really cold nighttime temperatures here in Vermont. And if you can actually get snow that peels in, um, I think someone's not on mute. I can hear someone sneezing or something like that. If everyone wouldn't mind going on mute, that would be, that would be appreciated. Um, yeah. Um, so bears will actually sleep most soundly in winters where there's a really good deep snow cover at the entrance to their den. The reason for that is that they, it actually kind of insulates them and cuts them off from those really cold nighttime temperatures and cold winter winds. Whereas on the years where it's kind of rainy a lot and then you get plunging temperatures and they're exposed, they'll actually awaken much more easily. They'll become much more restless. And so you can actually see when there's winter rains or things like that, that bears might sometimes become uncomfortable in the middle of the winter, especially if their den gets flooded out and uh, they actually leave their dens to seek a drier accommodation. They, they seek a, a drier place to stay. Um, but again, they can, they can den in a wide variety of places. Uh, one of the bears that the, the team that I was working with, not on a, uh, an outing that I went to, but a different time they were in the field, there was actually a bear that was denned in a tree, in a hole in a tree, about 15, 20 feet up from the ground. And that was where that bear was spending the winter. So pretty neat, the wide variety of accommodations that they seek. Now, a few of the mammals uh, kind of do a little bit of half and half. They can combine time spent in the den with time out for the winter. Um, so you get like a nice warm sunny day in the middle of the winter and you might see a red squirrel that comes out and uh, looks for food. They're actually gonna go find places that they've cached food. Um, usually most of them are under my bird feeder in the winter time. Most of them seem to accumulate most of the red squirrels in the state of Vermont uh, at my personal bird feeder. But yeah, if every few days they actually get up and the same with chip, chipmunks. Chipmunks hibernate in winter, but they don't sleep away through the whole season. They wake every few days. They actually raise their body temperatures all the way up to normal. Um, they'll feed on their stored food and they actually have to go outside and, and poop and pee. They defecate and urinate. Bears uh, don't ever rise to urinate and defecate in the winter. They completely shut that system down. They have specialized physiology that helps them out with that. Um, and one of the, the funny thing is, you know, everyone pictures a bear emerging from their den in the, in the spring. And you, there's that classic trope of, oh, the bear must be so grumpy and so hungry and you don't want to get in the way of your bear when it emerges from the den. That's actually not true. It takes them a week or 10 days actually to restart their digestive tract. They have to do their first poop, which after, you know, four or five, six months is going to be a, a, a big job. And uh, then they have to kind of get things moving with their digestive tract and kind of move things down before they can actually start to consume food and digest it again. And Another Vermont species that most people actually don't even know are in the state uh, are timber rattlesnakes. Um, these species actually also are among the hibernators. They den underground and they actually look for places where they can get um, below the frost line. They have winter hibernaculum um, that are below the frost line. And their biggest thing is that they just can't freeze. You know, they, all, the, all the herps, all the amphibians and reptiles have to get low enough um, to really avoid freezing. Um, and one of the big things about these guys is that snakes, uh, and particularly timber rattlesnakes, eat, you know, sometimes they'll eat a relatively big meal that takes them a while to digest. Because they're ectotherms, they're cold-blooded blooded creatures, they don't have the ability to regulate their body temperature, but they need a certain temperature range in order to digest. Their enzymes won't work for digestion below a certain temperature. And so those days in September where it gets kind of warm and sunny are so important to these animals if they happen to have had a larger meal recently because they need that time to completely digest and completely pass their food before they go in the den for the winter. If they have food material still left in their bellies before they go into their den, it actually, they can't digest it and it can actually kind of ferment and bloat and kill them. And so it's just so important for the uh, snakes and other creatures to go into their, uh, to completely digest that last meal. One of the neat things about snakes is that they'll actually sometimes be found in hibernaculum with multiple species. So you'll find a timber rattlesnake 
um, with like an American racer or uh, I think they're called Northern racers now, but like other species, garter snakes and things like that will den up in the exact same places. Um, and they don't seem very bothered by each other. So as I mentioned, the goal of all herps, all of the amphibians and reptiles is really to avoid freezing. So I found this diagram online. And one of the things that really struck me is you see fish there, fish are not herps. So that was, that was a little bit curious to me, but it really does, it's a good demonstration of the different strategies that they have. So you can see, you know, some of the snakes or some of the turtles will really try to get down under there. Um, a lot of the turtles will get down at the very bottom of streams and rivers where the water will continue to run and it'll stay just above or just at freezing. Um, a lot of frogs and salamanders will actually hibernate under rotting le leaves and logs on the forest floor. Rotting things can sometimes, especially a big rotting log, can sometimes generate a small amount of warmth, actually, that process of um, digestion and rotting. Um, you know, turtles will be at the bottom of ponds and rivers for most of the winter. Um, and some frogs, like wood frogs and peepers, will actually just be pretty close to the surface of the forest floor and in, in the duff. Um, they have a kind of a neat strategy. They actually put really high concentration of solutes. So basically, essentially antifreeze, it's the same concept as antifreeze. They put really high concentrations of things like sugars in their cells in order to really lower the temperature of freezing. They can get their, the temperature you know, down to the single digits in some cases um, before the water in their cells will freeze. The problem with freezing in you know, frogs or, or salamanders or really any animals is that ice crystals are sharp and they will actually puncture cells in your body. And so if anything, it's the same concept as when you get frostbite in your fingers. You hear of like the mountaineers on Mount Everest that get frostbite. And once you get uh, ice crystals forming in your cells, it just starts to kill that tissue because the sharpness of the ice crystals actually punctures all the cells in the, in the body. So that's really kind of the biggest thing that those things want to avoid. And then you got the adapters. So here's George's photo again of this uh, winter moose standing here, totally, completely unfazed by this cold. You know, um, they are tall animals. They're what's called, there's a term called a whole Arctic, whole Arctic. That means like moose and wolves and grizzly bears and a few other species that actually are found kind of in a ring around the Arctic Circle. So you can find moose in Northern Europe and Asia, um, all the way up through Northern North America and a lot of those other species as well. Um, and so they're really well adapted to the cold. They're very tall, their long legs can traverse atop the snow. In fact, kind of an interesting tidbit, moose are so well adapted to cold temperatures. They have those huge bodies that, um, you know, they don't have a lot of surface area because they're just so big and round and there's so much interior, kind of like a whale. There's not a whole lot of exterior that's facing the surface and they've got such thick fur. They are so well adapted to the cold that they actually have more trouble in the other end in the summertime. Um, moose can actually start to develop heat stress in the mid 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And mm -hmm. moose have actually been seen panting in like the lower 60s. And so these are species that really thrive in that winter time. Um, in fact, in the summertime, if it gets too hot, moose actually can stop feeding and they just spend their time seeking out cool waters or, you know, kind of shady breezy areas to really cool their body down. Um, so there's actually some concern from biologists who, as we're seeing kind of average warmer temperatures and average summer highs climbing are, are uh, uh, thinking that moose are probably going to start moving northward uh, in coming decades and centuries in response to kind of warmer climate. And we'll actually talk a little bit about mo more about some of the struggles moose face in a little bit. Let's see if this clicks forward, there we go. So white-tailed deer, another thriver, another adapter, right? White-tailed deer, you know, moose are kind of at the southern end of their range here in Vermont. White-tailed deer are more at the nother, northern end of their range. Um, so winter really is the limiting factor for deer that defines how many deer can survive here. Uh, when the snows get really deep and the temperatures plummet, deer are gonna be seeking out patches of forest with thick evergreen trees um, that protect them from those biting winds and deep snows. Um, and so that really makes the conservation of those areas, those deer wintering areas so important, right? Deer don't really eat much throughout the winter. They, they mostly kind of have a little bit of a starvation strategy. They basically just deplete their fat stores 
they eat a little bit of kind of like uh, some things like cedar trees or some twigs and bark and things like that, but they, they don't have a lot of uh, opportunities to feed. So late March and April is really a critical time for deer. If they can get some emerging plants and we get kind of an earlier spring, then you're gonna have uh, a, you know, a lot of the deer making it through the winter. But if you have a really, really snowy, deep snowed, cold temperature April, um, that's when you're gonna see a lot of winter die off for deer. And one of the issues with deer actually is people try to help them by putting out things like corn or apples. But it's, remember, it's important to remember that deer are ruminants, just like a cow. They don't actually digest a lot of their food. Their gut bacteria does a lot of that digestion for them. And the makeup of that gut bacteria changes throughout the year. So in the winter, they're really equipped to eat things like cedar and bark and things like that. They're not equipped to be eating things like corn. And so this was a case, this photo came from New Hampshire where someone was putting out corn for deer. And there were actually a dozen deer that were found dead all together um, that had died of bloat. Basically what happens is they eat all this corn because they're so hungry, but their, but their stomach has no ability to digest that corn. And so it just ferments and fills their body, bodies with gas and then they bloat and die. And so, uh, you know, some people occasionally, uh, when they're trying to help deer in the winter time, a particularly uh, hard winter, you know, the, the old adage is that the old hunters would chop down a cedar tree because that's kind of a more natural food source for deer. And if they can't access the top of it, you know, they chop it down so that they can get the rest of it. But it's just really important not to feed these animals. And we all know that not all of the birds migrate, right? Some stick around all year. So many of the resident bird species stay close to home things like chickadees, waxwings, nuthatches, juncos, um, ravens, woodpeckers, a lot of the birds that you see at the bird feeder in the winter time. Um, you know, there's more elbow room at the bird feeder or fruit tree this time of year. And so the, the year round residents actually face a lot less competition for food. Um, you can see one of their strategies on the really cold days as they fluff up their feathers, all their little downy feathers. So sometimes you'll on those nights or those mornings where it's 15 below and you wake up and you look out and you see the chickadee or the blue jay and they're just total little puffballs with their feathers all fluffed up trying to catch that uh, that body heat and keep it in there. And they also cache a lot of seeds and nuts for feeding on throughout the winter. In natural setting without um, a bird feeder there they'll actually cache a lot of things that they find in the summertime so that they can feed on in the winter. And people like to say the phrase bird brain kind of as an insult, but birds' brains are actually pretty advanced, pretty specialized for remembering the location of thousands of food cache sites. Um, a lot of the food caching mammals are the same ways. Um, they, can, they can remember those sites of a ton of different places. And there's that classic kind of march song, right? That cheeseburger tone, the song of the chickadees that's starting to warm up on those first warm spring days, right? I love chickadees. These things are such fun birds. I love this photo. It just captures the essence of chickadees to me that hanging upside down. So one of the best adapted species to a Northern New England winter, the ultimate adapters in my opinion, are these guys. This, is, this was a video that was taken on the US Fish and Wildlife Service up in the Nohegan Basin on the National Wildlife Refuge. And that is a Canada lynx. So really kind of a, a a, a neat species and one that we don't have too many of here in Vermont. It's actually a state endangered species. But as it goes by, watch those enormous front and back paws, right? So check it out. There you see those huge long legs in the back and those big back paws. So this is a photo by the naturalist Mary Holland. If anybody doesn't have her book, I highly recommend her getting, getting her book. It's absolutely fantastic. She's a Vermont naturalist. But this is the forepaw of two very closely related species, a Canada lynx and a bobcat. And you can see that Canada lynx are gonna be the northern species. You know, they're the northern version of a bobcat. Bobcat are the southern version of a Canada lynx, right? Those lynx are really well adapted to snow. Um, historically, actually, there weren't a whole lot of lynx records in Vermont until about, until the 21st century. There were only, uh, you know, before 1900, there were, you know, when the State Fish and Wildlife Department looked through the records, they only found four records of lynx trapped in Vermont. So historically, they're not really a species for whom Vermont's been the core of their habitat. Um, they're really well adapted to kind of a more northern, more boreal type forest. And the reason for that is because of these guys, their snowshoe hair. So this is a, a, a 
photo and I believe a mount that Sue Morse, the naturalist who, who runs Keeping Track, um, took. And here is a Canada lynx right next to their main prey, which is a snowshoe hare. And you can see they both have basically the same body shape and the same adaptation to that snowy winter environment. They both have the ability to use those feet like snowshoes to run on top of the snow, right? Um, the reason that we started to have Canada lynx in Vermont in the last 20 or 25 years was actually um, due to there was a um, uh, an insect blight in the boreal forests of Maine. And what happened was there were tons and tons of trees that were killed off. They went through and they did all of these salvage cuts and they created tons of young forest in Maine in the 1970s and 80s. And what that ended up doing was um, there was a boom in the snowshoe hare population, followed by a boom in the lynx population. And then all of a sudden you have way too many lynx for this small area and the lynx started to spread out. And that's really when we started seeing lynx in Vermont. And so biologists aren't sure if moving forward, we're gonna to continue to have this species in the state as a resident species. We, know, we do know that there has been some breeding uh, in Vermont. And I actually, I, I'm not sure what they've seen in the last year or two. I haven't checked in with those biologists, but I know that you know it may or may not be, lynx may or may not have a future in Vermont, because again, this isn't really the core of their habitat. So let's just finish up with a few of the threats and challenges, some of the difficulties that wildlife are facing uh, here in winter. What, what, what things are making it increasingly difficult for them, right? One of the first big ones is this idea of unpredictable weather patterns, right? Climate change, some people have said, shouldn't be called global warming, but global weirding. This idea of having rain on one day, and we saw this this winter already in, in December, we had this enormous snowstorm, especially in the Southern part of the state. And then on Christmas day, it was 55, 60 degrees and everything melted, right? That unpredictability makes it really difficult for wildlife. Wildlife really thrive under predictable conditions. Wildlife can deal with predictably snowy, predictably cold winters, right? But when you start having those huge vacillations, that causes a lot of challenges for wildlife. And so we'll talk about that. One of the first ones is this idea of loss of insulative snowpack. Um, so snow, as we mentioned when we talked about bears, is a, is a major insulator. It's actually one of the things that keeps bears warm, but a lot of small mammals. You can see in this photograph that a lot of uh, things like um, voles and mice and, and things like that, chipmunks, will actually burrow under the snow and create tunnels at ground level. And the reason for that is because if you get, you know, um, a nice, especially in the forest, right, if you get like a nice 20, 30, 40 inch snowpack, you know, like a really decent snowpack, especially up high, um, it can be 32 degrees, very close to the temperature of freezing down at ground level, even on nights where it's 20 below zero in the air temperature. And 32 may not sound very warm, but it's still 50 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than a negative 20 night. So that's a pretty significant difference. And so when you have a stable snowpack like we've had recently, uh, small mammals will do very well under there. When you have this vacillation of a lot of snow followed by a warm up, followed by a rain and then maybe an ice over, all of a sudden, instead of under a nice cushy insulated snowpack, um, the voles and mice and things like that are trying to run along the ground on top of like a glaze of ice. And that's really difficult for a lot of these species. The picture on the left here is one that I took and that's actually uh, the entrance to a bear den. You can see the, the frost that's created as a result of the breath coming out from, from the edge of the den. And you can see that it just snowed right over just to the point where there's a little breathing hole that's coming through there. But there was actually an incident in Russia in 2013 where you had that really unpredictable weather. You had um, winter rains, which they don't normally get in this area of Siberia and the tundra. And then all of a sudden it got very cold and totally iced over on the tundra. And in that one single event, over the course of a week or two, there actually were 60,000 reindeer that were killed in Russia as a result of that one incident, right? Another issue with this unpredictability is this idea of loss of camouflage. So things like snowshoe hares, um, short-tailed weasels, a lot of these animals, they're gonna turn white in winter, kind of no matter what, right? They are not basing it on how much snow there is in the ground, they base it on the time of year. And so the only ad adaptation that this animal has other than its ability to run away quickly is its uh, camouflage. 
And this thing thinks that it's perfectly camouflaged. If it stays hit still, you won't see it. But as you can see, this is blazingly white on a brown background, right? So uh, this photograph was taken by a professor of mine from University of Montana, Scott Mills. And he actually was studying the effects of climate change on species like this um, that rely on that camouflage that's gonna become more unpredictable in the future. And then the change in timing of natural events is another big one. So birds that migrate, we talked about those migrators coming back into the Vermont in the springtime. Um, things like buds popping and the insects coming out. If that's happening earlier in the year, but the birds aren't adjusting quite as well, um, that can pre prevent, you know, present one of these unpredictable difficulties, right? Um, a, a few years ago at Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area, I actually saw bluebirds nesting um, and, and exhibiting nesting behavior on February 24th which is just incredibly early. There's not gonna be any insects uh, out that early, but probably that very particular, it was two or three winters ago, there was a really warm uh, winter and just certain elements in the environment triggered them, said it's time to start nesting, but they may have started raising a family and there were no insects out, right? And then here's another one that people sometimes don't think of is the idea of wildlife trails. So, you know, there is supposed to be kind of a, a battle of adaptation, right? In the winter time where snow is supposed to be that limiting factor. It's some, it, it makes things harder for a prey species like a deer to move around and get food, but it may also make things harder for a predator species like a wolf or in, in the case of Vermont, a coyote um, to be able to get deeper in the woods and move around a lot. But something like a trail, like a groomed trail, which we all love to go cross country skiing or snowmobiling or things like that can actually make it easier for a predator to move around in the forest and wait, waste a lot less energy and cover a much bigger area trying to get prey. So um, another, another thing with trails that people have pointed out is that there's, you know, we were just looking at how important it is for a lot of those animals to tunnel underneath the snow in the winter time. Well, something like a trail like this really compacts the snow and can actually cut off some of these tunnels. If something like a vole can't tunnel through this if the snow is too hard and compacted underneath. And then moose are kind of one of those flagship species where this unpredictably, the changes are making things more difficult for them in the winter time, right? Um, and the reason for that is actually this thing that we're all hearing about, right? This winter tick. Now the issue with winter ticks, the reason they're called winter ticks is because other than kind of the colder half of the year, the actual tick is not found in the landscape. There are only eggs. There are no living ticks. There are just eggs. And so with their life cycle in the year, two really crucial times for them is this March, April time when the females disengage from the moose and fall down to the ground. And then the fall when they go, when they're born and they try to go find um, a, a moose to go, uh, you know, suck the blood of. And that, that springtime especially is really a crucial time for them as they're, as they're falling off the moose. So like late winter, early spring, well, one of the issues with that is that if they fall off the moose and they fall onto snow, they more often die. If they fall off onto bare ground, their survival rate goes way up. And so as the winters are starting to end earlier, um, winter tick numbers have really started to climb. So this is Joe's Pond up in the Northeast Kingdom. They have a contest every year where they put something out on the ice to see when it's gonna fall through the ice. And this is, um, you know, kind of the trend line that we're seeing, even just in the last uh, 30, 30 plus years of shorter winters of uh, spring coming earlier, right? Now, one of the problems with that is moose really tend to aggregate a lot during this time of year. So this is a, a moose wintering ground up in the Northeast Kingdom. I like to call these French poodle trees because this is what the moose will do to them, right? They eat, you know, up, as, as Aldo Leopold said, they defoliated to the height of a saddle horn on a horse, right? They'll, they'll eat right up to that point, but they also come together a lot and that actually promotes these ticks to some degree from, from happening. So going out on uh, one of the studies that the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department was doing recently, you can see the effect of this where the moose are being bled dry by these ticks. And you can see an engorged female right by that fingernail there and then the smaller male right next to it. Um, and one of the things that can happen with that is that it overwhelms the moose um, because, you know, as we mentioned, they're a cold adaptive species. They're, they're in these cold environments, but they end up getting so irritated by these ticks that they rub a lot of their fur off 
um, and they lose a lot of that cold adaptation. So I'm gonna skip forward just a little bit here. Oh, this is one last thing that I'll say is that, you know, the biggest thing that wildlife need is they need to move around to find the resources they need to survive in the winter, right? So one of the issues with that is this is my neighborhood right here in Stowe Hollow. So right, my, my house, if you can see it, <laughs> you can't see me pointing, but I'm right in the top right corner of this, right? Um, and this is 1962 right here in the Stowe Hollow area. And you can see um, these maps were created by, by the way, by a colleague of mine, Jens Hilko with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. And you can kind of see one of the things that's uh, exacerbating the difficulties for a lot of wildlife in winter on this map, on this transition, right? So here's 1974, and you can see some of the roads going up into these kind of larger blocks of wilderness. 1980, you see some of the roads really getting way up there in the mountains. 1996, um, they're kind of, you know, you can see a lot of this development. 2007, it's getting even more chopped up. And then here's 2011. And so, um, you know, this is the type of thing that really makes it difficult for wildlife, especially in the wintertime, because they need to find the exact conditions they need to access and they need to move around using minimal energy to do that. And when the landscape gets more and more kind of chopped up like this into smaller and smaller uh, habitat fragments, that really can make it difficult for them. Um, and so I'm gonna skip forward to the second to last slide because I wanna give plenty of room for questions. And, whoops. But all I wanna say is that one of the things that we're really working on here at the Nature Conservancy is creating some of these corridors of conserved habitat where you can really allow wildlife to move from one place to another. So bears need to move to find the perfect den sites. Um, you know, mammals need to move to find the places that they can forage and then cache that food for the winter. And animals actually learn those things from one another. There was a really interesting article that I read in the Atlantic today talking about how animals pass this knowledge from one to the other. But this idea of maintaining connected and healthy habitats is the absolute best thing we can be doing for everything from moose to bears to any of these species to help them survive the Vermont winter. And so I just wanna finish, this is a really neat thing. This is from an article of National Geographic from 1998. And I read this when I was a kid, when I was 16 years old, it's about Vermont. And I absolutely loved it. And it's one of the things that inspired me to want to live here for my life and spend my career here and raise my family. Um, it's an article. I'll just read this one quick paragraph to finish by a guy named Edward Hoagland. And he talks about winter. And this really struck me as a way of finishing this lecture. He says, winter defines how much wildlife raw land as the farmers call it can carry. When winter shuts in, the food supply crashes and many denizens such as bears, chipmunks, groundhogs, jumping mice and reptiles go underground or else fly south. So he's talking about exactly what we were talking about. The snow pile and wood pile become talismans like the interplay of light off steep angles of white, gray, black or soft wood green and the endless off white mounds of snow. Um, let's see, is it? Snow slows wife, grinds a bit out of you probably forever, and Vermonters call themselves woodchucks because they've learned to hibernate under the weight of it instead of fighting for primacy as newcomers do. It puts a damper on some of the extravagances of summer, summer sunnier climes, the doubled up bankruptcies, divorces, and such. So I just love that, that uh, reflection of winter here in Vermont. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody, for uh, coming on this lecture. And I'd be more than happy to ask and answer any questions you all have. So let's see. Why don't I actually stop sharing so we can all see each other? And Let's see, where are our hosts? I can't see Erwin, there we go. So Erwin, do you, how do you wanna manage questions? Are you there? I'm going to, there we go. I'm going to figure out how to unmute everybody. <laughs> and- um, why, don't we, why don't we just unmute the person who's asking the question? Because I, 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 I fear chaos if the entire crew is unmuted. I think folks can unmute themselves. I think they can. Yeah, so if somebody has a question, why don't you get started? 
Go, go ahead. I see somebody raising their hand there. The gentleman in the green jacket. Yeah, thank you. It's Steve Swinburne here. Uh, great, great uh, presentation, Tom. I, I took a long walk today for about three miles, and I can understand how all these little voles and, and mice can live down below under there. They've got mm -hmm. the food cache. They've got the seeds and all the stuff that they've saved up. But I was thinking about a fox. Mm -hmm. And as a predator, they've got to, they, can't, they don't have any cash food pretty much. They've got to rely, right, on, on eating those things down below. So my question is, do you think those foxes are getting to the voles and the mice by smell or by hearing? I, you know, you see these, um, you see these videos of where they're, you know, they're cocking their head. Do you think, yep. do you think it is a hearing thing or a smelling thing? What is it? I, I think it's some combination. I think you're exactly right. Um, it's some combination, but a lot of it is hearing. So they can smell that a bowl is in the area. And then, you know, obviously I don't think they can pinpoint exactly where under the snow it is using just their nose. And so that's what they do. They do that exact thing where they listen for it running out under the snow and then they leap up in the air and they stomp down with their paws as hard as they can. And what they're actually trying to do is trap the bowl under the snow, oh. you know, like so push the snow right on top of it, almost like an avalanche, like a, like a climber being stuck in an avalanche, that kind of like heavy, heavy snow that traps you. And then they dig down as fast as they can with their, their snout or their forepaws and they grab it up. Um, one of the neat things about foxes actually is they, you know, they have just incredibly thick fur. Arctic foxes um, have the lowest, oh, I, had, I took a winter ecology course in college and there's a term for this. It's the rate at which it's the point at which the temperature at which a body of a, of a particular species has to start to elevate, to shiver or do things like that in order to maintain their body temperature. Human beings are so pathetic. We're at like, I think if you sat us naked and unmoving, so no clothing, no insulation in a room, uh, I think it's in the low 70s, where if we were totally unmoving and didn't have any insulation on, we would start to have to shiver a little, you know, just minor shivers to raise our body temperature up. Arctic foxes is something like 25 below zero. They can, you know, they can be perfectly comfortable. Uh, a couple of those species like Arctic foxes and um, polar bears are so well insulated that they're actually hard to even see on infrared radar. The only thing you can see a lot of the times is just their breath and their nose, um, just because they, so little, little heat is coming off them. So kind of a neat thing about foxes there. Wonder how many days a fox can go without food before it dies, before the cold gets to it. Mm. You know? Yeah. You know, their their metabolic requirements, their, you know, their needs to feed are going to be much higher in the winter, um, just because of that need to kind of like keep the stove going in their in their their internal furnace in order to keep themselves warm. But yeah, great question, Steve. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes. I think. Uh, I just want to oh, say, I think there's sorry. some uh, questions in the chat box that uh, maybe the uh, presenter would like to. Uh, oh, look. sure. Oh, boy. Why don't we do one more live question? I think someone named Mary just raised their hand. And then I'll, I'll do some of these. Uh, yeah, I, okay, I'm unmuted. Okay. Yep. Um, we, we had a mink at our pond a couple of years ago. And I wonder how they survived the winter. I mean, this critter was diving uh, under the ice and coming back up through um, like a blowhole. And yep. and uh, I'm just wondering how it can survive yeah. those temperatures. So mink and otters um, do mostly eat fish. They live alongside beavers, which are gonna only eat plants. And so beavers can actually, beavers do that cache thing where they have all their food that they need for the winter. And once the pond freezes over, that's it. They're going in and out of their den and they're in there. Um, whereas, you know, otters and mink by and large are probably gonna need to continue to get access to underwater and to get back out again in order to find those fish. Um, I would guess, you know, I don't know the exact answer but I would guess that they really just look for those areas of moving water where they can still get some access to get under the water to try to find crayfish and fish and, and clams and some of those things that they're gonna eat. Um, but then once that freezes over, they're gonna you know, really have to either look for places they can find it or uh, prey switch a little bit, try to find some other you know, 
animals that they can find to eat uh, during the rest of the year. So, I can so imagine they, it'd be a lot they don't hibernate? They don't, no. By and large, I don't, I don't believe either of those animals uh, hibernate, no. Okay, no. thank you. So a couple of the so questions Tom, here. So Tom, I've just been reviewing this. Uh, uh, yeah. Save you some time. A lot of nice comments, a lot of interesting sharing. But as far as questions go, uh, I'm gonna jump forward to Jeff Forward, uh, who asks, is climate change partially responsible for the loss of reindeer in Vermont? Reindeer in Vermont. Whoa. Yeah, that's a good question. So there used to be a lot of different species in Vermont that are no longer here. And you're right, rain, you know, um, caribou was one of the species that we used to have in Vermont. Um, you know, I, I'm i pretty sure caribou were out of the state before there was even uh, industrialization that promoted climate change. You know, the burning of coal and other fossil fuels. I think a lot of that was more to do with habitat changes. Um, there used to be elk in Vermont. There used to be uh, mountain lions and wolves um, and a lot of different species. And most of them were pushed out as a result of changes in habitat uses and over harvest. Um, so I don't believe that had anything to do with reindeer or caribou leaving Vermont. That's a great question. I see one here asking about timber rattlesnakes. Are they venomous? So that's a good question. The person actually said, are, they, are the rattlesnakes poisonous? And somebody else answered venomous. And so there actually is a difference between those two things. Yes, timber rattlesnakes are venomous. Yes, we do have them in Vermont. They're in two locations in Western Rutland County. Um, they're both on, both populations are on uh, conserved land that have been conserved by the Nature Conservancy. Um, and they are venomous. Poisonous things are things that you eat that then harm you. So like a mushroom is poisonous, a snake is venomous. In order for something to be venomous, it has to be able to envenomate. So like a spider or a snake is venomous, a mushroom is poisonous. That's, that's kind of that uh, little nerdy definition for you. Um, but one of the interesting things about timber rattlesnakes, I've actually spent a decent amount of time um, near their den sites. And the ones in Vermont are actually very docile. Um, you know, timber rattlesnakes out west and like Oklahoma and places like that are known to be a pretty aggressive species. But there's actually kind of a little bit, as you move across the North American landscape, there's a gradient of behaviors. And by the time you get to Vermont, you know, I've walked around timber rattlesnakes. Uh, you know, the areas that they den are, are kind of closed off to the public. I was there for work. Um, and they just seem very unfazed by you. Um, the only uh, uh, record that we have of anybody being bitten by a timber rattlesnake was somebody who picked one up and handled it. Um, so very, very, very cool, very docile species here in Vermont. By the way, uh, going back to the uh, uh, previous discussion about prior species in Vermont, uh, you're interested in that? We had a great talk on that a few weeks ago that you can look at. Oh, the prior talking. species, like like elk and things like that? Yeah. Oh, no yeah. kidding. That would have been fascinating. Yeah. Somebody asked yeah. what category do wild turkeys fit into? The wild turkeys are, are the thrivers. Um, you know, they... Uh, when it gets really, really snowy and very cold, they're the kind of in that adaptive category. They don't migrate out of the state. They're around. Um, they can sometimes just roost for two or three days at a time. If there's just like a terrible blizzard and the temperatures plunge, they'll sit up in a tree. Um, you know, they'll find like a big white pine with a lot of uh, windbreak and they'll just sit there and wait it out. And then as soon as that period of time has, has passed, um, they'll go right down and try to forage for food again. And they spend a lot of their time... Uh, dealing their best with the snow and trying to find as much food as they can under it. What do they eat in the snow? Um, you know, they'll eat a lot of things like, like acorns or beech nuts, a lot of the same things that deer will eat. Um, the nice thing is they can probably forage for some of it like up in the trees, um, but they are down on the ground, uh, you know, more than, you know, like a, a, a completely perching bird. Um, they're not going to move around on a tree quite as much. So, yeah, somebody asked what happens to the fish when the lake freezes? That's a really good question. Um, and um, so fish, the, the limiting factor for fish survival oftentimes is oxygen. So they need dissolved oxygen in the water. So like a trout, um, colder water holds more oxygen. So a trout really struggles when it gets too warm. And that's why uh, people fear for brook trout in Vermont in a changing climate, right? 
um, when a lake freezes over, it can actually be kind of tough for some fish, especially when it's a really shallow lake. And you can get some die off um, of fish in like a very shallow pond if the lake freezes over and stays thickly frozen all year because the, the water is not mixing with the air and reoxygenating the water. And so you can get very, very low oxygen levels. So even a fish like a, like a bass that doesn't have very high oxygen requirements, um, some of those fish or like a perch or things like that, they can actually struggle a little bit and you can get some die off in the winter in a very uh, shallow pond. Any pond with any sort of depth where you can, uh, you know, kind of move around and, you know, find fresh oxygen supplies, fish tend to do just fine. But that's really the limiting factor for them. It's really not the temperature. It's just access to that oxygen. All right. Uh, even the snakes in Vermont are more chill. That's very true. Yeah. Um, so am I missing any questions here? I've kind of been skipping around. No. Oh, this one's kind of cool. This idea that a chickadee's brain grows bigger in the late fall as they store their seeds and bugs for the winter. Yeah, that's a really neat one. Um, that they actually physically grow the size of their brain in order to fit all those all those uh, food cache sites in. So kind of neat. Well, we're getting close to the hour. So Erwin, you want me to uh, put it back over to you? Okay, anybody else before we call it a night? Um, Speak now or forever hold your peace. What mostly, oh, someone's here. Um, uh, Mary, did you want to say something? She's muted. Okay. There was a question in the chat um, uh, about are there things we can do to help animals through the winter? That yeah. I, yeah, I think that's appropriate. Totally. Yeah. So a few things. One is that idea, and, and, I, and, I, and I don't mean it to, to be too big of an answer, but one of the biggest things is really just this idea of conserving healthy and connected habitats. Um, anything we can do to create healthy and connected habitats for wildlife is going to help them in the winter. Um, generally putting out food for them other than you know, bird seed and things like that, um, it's, it's, it's generally not advised to put out food for a wildlife for a lot of different reasons. Deer aren't the only ones that have trouble adjusting to that and adapting to that. Um, one of the things you can do is just create um, a lot of like plants, you know, plant a lot of plants that are going to help, you know, seed at different times of the year and, uh, you know, fruit trees and things like that that are going to provide food for them throughout the entire winter. So just little things like that um, that you can do, um, you know, Feeding birds, I, I feed birds behind my house and I love it because I love seeing birds. But a lot of the research actually shows that it, that's really for us, that birds, you know, songbirds and things like that, they generally can survive winter um, just fine without supplemental food. Um, it's really, you know, just for our enjoyment um, and the love of seeing birds that we feed them. But uh, as far as the birds concerned, it, apparently it really doesn't make that big a difference in terms of their survival rates, surprisingly. So the biggest thing we can really do is just promote really good habitat that's going to make uh, the animals really healthy going into the winter and give them the availability of the resources they need to get through the winter. So that's what uh, I got. Steve, did you have a question? I have, but I think Jeremy does. Jeremy, I, go ahead. I do. I know this is about snow. But you touched on the monarchs, yeah, uh, which really fascinate me. And we have stopped cutting our fields so that the uh, milkweed would grow. Is that a is that a suggestion that you would have? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So monarchs for a while um, they really started to decline a lot. And my most the most recent thing that I've heard is that they've started to level off a bit. That people are not as um, frighteningly concerned about monarchs as they were say five or ten years ago um but there are a couple of things that are that are promoting that they think one is the neonicotinoids nicotinoids which is the um um you know uh, pest control chemicals that they'll use and the other is just the fact that we don't have a whole lot of old field habitat as much as we used to um that in the midwest you know say uh, naturally you know four or five hundred years ago in the Midwestern United States and Canada, there used to be just all kinds of old field habitat that had tons of milkweed and tons of old field plants. 
And now a lot of that region of North America has been turned into monocultures where they'll put corn and soy right to the very edge of the road. And there aren't even little strips of weed and wildflowers like there used to be. And so they, the, the um, entomologists really think that the Northeastern United States and Vermont in particular is gonna be a stronghold for monarchs and a lot of pollinators because we have a lot of those old fields. We have the dairy industry where um, you've got cows grazing in fields and you have um, just a lot of that kind of weedy shrubby habitat. And you're absolutely right. That's one of the best things you can do for monarchs and for other habitat and for other, um, for other uh, pollinators just to leave, um, you know, un unmowed fields that maybe only get brushed hog every few years kind of thing. And the use of the uh, Roundup. Right, the Roundup, yeah, the neonicotinoids. Yeah, that's that's the Roundup. That's that, um, uh, or maybe those are different. I Roundup is uh, maybe Roundup not. Is, oh God, I can't think of the name of it now. Glyphosate. Yeah, it's um, glyphos glyphosate, yeah, which is, glyphosate, I don't yes. think a neonicotinoid, but basically it's the, the pesticides that are being used that are killing a lot of them. So, thank you very much. It was a wonderful program from Ned Kelly. Oh, good. Well, thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Uh, uh, just so everybody knows, uh, if you've missed the talk or want to hear it again or share it, uh, I posted in the chat the link to the London Dairy Conservation Commission YouTube channel, where you'll be able to see this after uh, it gets posted in a few days. It's a big nasty links, so please copy and paste it now, and uh, we'll be able to uh, create easy customizable links if we get a thousand uh, people signed up. So uh, <laughs> please sign up. In the meantime, just copy and paste this one. We'll get this video up on there in a few days. And uh, that also includes the uh, lecture on um, uh, uh, species, Vermont species over the years that have changed and come and gone. That's pretty cool talk. Anyway, thanks again, Tom. That was really great. I think everybody enjoyed it. This was our biggest uh, Zoom uh, session yet. So uh, we appreciate all of you being here. Thank you and have a great evening. Great. great. Thank, you. Right. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. See you guys. Thanks, Erwin. Yeah. Would you be able to send that link to me again? I, I, I'm sorry, it's still here before you shut down. Um, that... Catherine, sorry. I was just trying to get that link and I, I, I didn't quite capture it, but I think I, I've just copied it here. Um, I want to make sure that I'm on your email list in case I don't get the link. Yes. Um, and well, I'm moving it up. I didn't. I didn't shut the. Uh, I haven't shut the meeting down yet. So. Okay. I'm gonna just see if it. It didn't paste the last time. Oh. Huh. Just because I had something else. Yeah, something else is 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 in is refuses to get out of my copy save and it keeps coming up as something else. So. Well, what if instead of copying it, you just uh, click on it and then copy it once you open the page? Yeah. Oh, I guess, yeah, yeah, I, there, it did open up. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Okay. And Steve, it's always a pleasure to be able just to look at the sitting there. It's really, uh, you're like a screensaver, you know, on my, on my screen, I can just leave you. I'll just keep looping a picture of you. Great job, Erwin. <laughs> Erwin, thank you. That was really good. He's, this guy is great. Where did, and he, um, yeah, I mean, it was really a really a good talk. Yeah, yeah Helen got him. Is that a porcupine? Um, so you, only thing I was thinking, Erwin, is maybe we could put a plug in for our next. Oh. Sonny, I think you're breaking up. Except yeah. I wasn't thinking what it, I was drawing a blank. Okay. No, well, Sonny, we, we lost you there. We broke up. I think it's okay. I can't come back.
<laughs> yeah, we need a uh, we need some kind of hand signals when people break up. You know, like how about it? yeah. Well, I, Erwin, I could give you a hand signal, but it's not very nice. I gotta uh, go. <laughs> this is this is a family program. Exactly. Thank you so much, my friend. We'll see you later. All right, man. So everybody got. Uh, well, I'm gonna shut it down now. I hope everybody got the copy of that uh, link. Thank you. Uh, have a good night, everybody.